Good evening, everybody. Thanks so much for coming out tonight. Uh, my name is Mac McFarland, and I am the director of the Center for Contemporary Art and Culture here at PNCA. And I want to begin this evening um, by recognizing that we are guests on this land beneath our feet. Um, and we come here as guests on this land through a, a system of colonialism, of slavery, of a culture of dominance. Um, and that the people here before us were people known as the Chinook, um, people known as the Chinook, the Multnomah, the Clackamas, and many other tribes. And that we should remember our status as guests on this land and try to act as guests. It's really exciting evening for us, I think, tonight. We have a sort of double header lineup of talks. Um, you could think of it as there are two talks from three artists, or you might also think of it as that there are uh, four talks from three artists. And we'll sort of see how that might go. Um, and so the way we will uh, approach this evening is that I'm going to introduce Sarah Seastrom here to my right. Um, and then there will be a, a brief moment of technological wizardry uh, then you will be distracted by my introductions of Ryan Griffiths and Sarah Ross at that moment. So Sarah Seastrom uh, is an artist living here in Portland, Oregon. She is part of the Hannes Coos tribe in the south coast of Oregon. Um, and her involvement with PNCA goes back far, but her involvement here within the exhibition that both Sarah, Sarah, and Ryan are a part of the Earth Will Not Abide and the 511 Gallery right now. Um, Sarah's involvement in that exhibition is one um, that really dates back quite a long time, almost before even the idea of bringing the exhibition started. Uh, Sarah uh, was somebody I reached out to right away as we were working on a mapping project called Learning from Cascadia that's a part of the exhibition. Um, and really it was, it was to get Sarah's input uh, within that project and then that really grew into something um, that has a lot to do with uh, my desires as a curator uh, to try to have a bit of an unsettled practice, um, my desires to bring a bit of an unsettled practice to the college. So this is a, a really lovely culminating evening um, for some of that and I wouldn't, I wouldn't put a, a period on that culmination but a comma. Um, I've known Sarah's work for over a decade, really through um, some gestural and uh, re repetitive image making paintings and printmaking. Um, and then Sarah also is, a, is an artist who creates these amazing woven works that I started seeing around town, as, as well as displays of materials as we have here at PNCA in the historic corridor. Um, and, and she's really going to get into all of this, so I'm not going to kind of spoil any uh, insights that I have um, on that before she contradicts me. Um, Sarah earned her MFA at uh, Pratt in New York City. Um, she's then moved back to Portland and has been teaching at PSU and PNCA and many other places. Uh, she also does a tremendous amount of workshops in weaving and classes in weaving uh, for her tribe and others. Um, she's probably going to talk a bit about that this evening. Um, she's represented by Ogden Gallery here in Portland. She had a show here in September that was chosen by the Oregonian as a must-see fall exhibition. Um, and she has displayed work all over uh, the country and in Canada, including the Museum of Northwest Art, the Missoula Art Museum, and the Art Gallery of Greater Victoria. Uh, many, many other places. And it's, I think, a real pleasure uh, to welcome Sarah here to the microphone. Thank you. Thanks, Mac. Thanks, light guy up there. Wizards everywhere. Um, and thank you, PNCA, for having me and hosting my work. Um, it's an honor to be here and a really exciting project to be included in. So thank you all. 
Also, I'm coming out on a Tuesday night on a holiday week. I know it's a lot. And to my students, here we go. I've got students in the room. Um, I'm Sarah Seastream. I'm a Hannes Kuss tribal member, artist, and educator. Um, the talk I'm going to give you today is a little more personal than what I would usually do. Uh, but I just delivered this down in Coos Bay for the federal and state governments with my tribe. And um, it was particularly personal because it was in my home region. And it went well, and we decided to bring it to you. So um, it is, like I said, a little more personal than I would normally do. Um, I begin with these two slides that locate me in, in uh, Oregon. Um, the one on the right-hand side, that is um, the ancestral homeland of all of my um, ancestors on my father's side. So that's uh, the north spit of Jordan Cove, which is um, in Coos Bay. You can see a man there digging clams, so it's still used as a food space. When you look behind it, that's a mill, an industrial um, stuff going on behind, so it's kind of a mixed bag. If you're not familiar with the upcoming uh, LNG project in Jordan Cove, put that on your list of research items. Um, to give you insight to my tribe, we're salmon people. Um, we mean that to say that we are related to the salmon and that's how we describe ourselves. Um, the story I'm gonna share with you today is a salmon story. The metaphor of the salmon is they start in the mountains. Um, they are born in the mountains, they swim downstream, they go out through the river, they go out into the ocean, they gain muscle and worldliness, and then they make their way back home to start the cycle again and have something to offer for their families. Um, this is from our salmon ceremony this year. It's kind of a brag. Um, I'm from a place called Scottsburg. It's on the Umpqua River Valley. That's there on the right-hand side. And those are salmon berries on the left-hand side. Uh, salmon berries bring the salmon home. When they grow up the creek bed, the salmon follow the scent, and it leads them home. Um, like I said, it'd be personal. So this is me and my dad. Uh, I shared the, our grade school pictures because I was in Coos Bay where people he may have grown up with uh, were that there on the left-hand side, that far side. That's him and I here in Portland when we moved here. Uh, we're putting in an irrigation system in a, um, what is it? It's not Klickapat, um, Kinnikinick field for my grandmother here. Um, my training began in the home. Uh, that's a traditional indigenous way of coming up. So everyone in my family practiced the arts. And so uh, arts and science and spirituality are integrated in an indigenous worldview. And so this is just uh, one regular day in our family. Um, I live here in Portland now. Um, that on the right-hand side is the Columbia River and some weaving materials. And that on the left is my cat Ramona who thinks weaving is hilarious. She sneaks in everywhere. Um, that to kind of show you where we came. So in the 80s, we moved into Portland to, um, there were jobs for my family. And so I grew up here in the public schools. Um, coming up in my family, we didn't say, well, this is an Indian thing or this is a white thing. It's just, this is the way we do things. But once I got into the public schools, it became really clear that there was a pretty big difference in the way that I um, looked at the world and the way that a lot of my peers did. Oh good, my guys are coming in, some more students. Hey guys, come on, hi. <laughs> I'm glad you made it. There's spots right up here in the front. Come on. Um, so I've got an artistic practice that's got kind of three parts. Um, the first piece is uh, painting. So as it was mentioned, I, I come up as a painter. Um, my paintings look like this. This one's called Hannes Kuss. Uh, it's almost that big in person. Um, my paintings are... Well, I'll get into those in a minute. So this, my first language in my work is uh, painting. Um, the second part of my work uh, is I'm a teacher. Um, and this is my favorite drawing of the year for one of my drawing students. Um, so this is just a whole place for that. So a master artist has like several jobs. They have to write this one line in history that's their voice. Um, that's a new statement in the canister. It's also our job to bring up the next generation of artists and to help them get their training, bring them into the world. And then the third part for me is institutional reform. So museums and schools, different institutions hire me to come in and help them update how they talk about indigenous art to the mainstream. There's kind of two parts that I do for these places. One, I work with their educators 
and their curators to help design the forward-facing stuff. And then I also work in collections, so going in and um, looking through all of their historic items that they hold of ours and try to inform them and help them understand what those items are all about. This is a, a medicine bag of my ancestors that's held in a collection at Berkeley that I went and visited with a couple um, two years ago probably. And I, you will see two items from this motif come up again and again throughout this talk. So, you know, foreshadowing. Um, so now I'm going to tell you a little about my painting practice. So um, I've been making paintings that look a lot like this since I was a little kid. It comes, it's a real innate way of me to interact. Um, but through my training, I've devised kind of a language to help talk about this abstraction with other people. Um, they're based on an observation of nature. So in nature, we see that systems repeat in a rhythmic pattern. And once that builds up a certain amount of energy, life or change emerges from that. You see it in the seasons. You see it in the way the plan is smooth. You see it in reproduction. There's a energetic kind of charge that builds up. And I extrapolate that it's possible to create a similar charge in art making. And I witness that in the masterworks all through time. And most humans kind of have had that experience where you get some kind of visceral reaction. So I've combined this observation of nature with a formal practice where I have a very limited palette and materials and things and I kind of repeat uh, action inside of that and look for nature to emerge. Um, this painting is called Headlights on the Monolith. It's maybe half that big. It's pretty big though and that looks pretty good. It's nice to see it like that. Um, so I, I have this improvisational practice and then I'm looking into the noise I create for things I recognize from the world, usually the land, animals, stuff like that. Um, so this one, uh, to me, there's a island in um, Sunset Bay, which is down in the Coos Bay area, where it's one of our origin stories called the Women and Children's Island. You can see it in Sunset Bay. Um, and a small group of women and children hung out there during a massacre and that's where one group of our families uh, survived out of. Um, I was thinking about when you're in a car at night and it's raining really hard and you swing around and the lights illuminate something, sometimes a monolithic uh, island, things like that. That's, that's what that looked like to me. So that's what that one's called. Um, Bear Butte. Um, this was in, not last year, this show, but the show before. Um, part of growing up in Portland and not being in close touch with my home environment is a kind of a loneliness for the land. And most people in this room are probably connect with the idea that art making is something that has helped keep them alive. You know, it's a medicinal activity for our mental health and our spiritual health. Um, so for me, making this kind of work is a way to connect with the psychic quantity of the land that is embedded in, inside of my body and to draw that out. And it, it quells the loneliness for the land. Um, that I experience in an urban environment. Um, there are certainly lovely other ways to find friendship in our communities, but the longing for the land, um, I have been able to find a bridge within myself through this painting process. So when um, things like this emerge, that's an activity of survival for me. It's another one from that show, um, from that one as well, Thaw. Uh, sometimes, oh, Eagle Peak Barteau, um, sometimes it's a way to deal with mourning. Um, Rick Barteau is a, was a Wyatt Yurok painter who many of you are probably familiar with. We lost him about two years ago. So this one came up and I think of it as an eagle, which is this figure over here on the right hand side of the painting. Um, the specific gravity of clouds, at times it's a metaphor. Um, so thinking of the weeping from the clouds to the breaking of your heart and the interface between those things, a way to get out of that. Um, sometimes it is another kind of exorcism. I have, there's only a few more sad stories, then we're going to get into some <laughs> easier stuff. Um, so this one's called The Cliffs. Uh, my dad doesn't talk about a lot of our, um, the heartbreak in our culture because it's really traumatizing. Um, but sometimes he gives me things when I really need them. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Highway 101 and the Oregon coast. Um, probably if you are, I've seen the Sea Lion Caves. Um, 
when I was growing up, I always wanted to stop there because uh, it's a wonderful tourist trap. There's a, they let you go down into the caves and the sea lions fill up these huge caverns and it's pretty incredible. So once my dad did take me down there and then a few years ago he was telling me that um, that happens to be one of our massacre sites. Um, so in the 1850s when my tribe was, um, they were looking to exterminate our tribe, they did a couple things. So they showed up all at once they burnt all of our architecture to the ground, which was pretty significant architecture, really incredible plank houses um, that we've been living in for thousands of years because we were not wasteful with such um, castles. Uh, so they burnt those things to the ground and then began to march us up the coast to put us in reservations, first in Reed's Fort and then further up in Elsie. So uh, sea lion caves are in between those two places. Um, and because you know uh, they weren't looking to preserve our lives, it would be okay if they would lose great numbers of us at, at times. And so when they got to Sea Lion Caves, they pushed all but about seven women off the cliffs there. And so in a really quick and efficient way, we were brought down to really um, dire, dire straits. Um, you know, when you're in places in Oregon, sometimes there's a haunting feeling and there's a reason for that. And so as much as I don't mean to break your heart, I do, I do hope that next time you're in a place like that, you take a quiet moment and say hello to my grandmothers because they're there <laughs> and they are very aware of you. So when you get those feelings when you're in these places, um, there's a reason for it. And uh, there's, there's more to this place than the, the surface of it. Um, the diagram for the mass movement of human beings, that's pretty heavy. Um, that one, I had seen a diagram for slave ships for um, packing people in to get more in to make more efficient that part of American history. And um, the tie-in with uh, America as a superpower, if you do not have to pay for the labor and you do not have to pay for the resources, you become exponentially rich. And um, I feel a real connection to how um, African people and our people, my people were forced into a marriage there. And so this painting was a way to try to get that image out of my head. Um, it just, you know, social media is amazing because you just get just bombarded with things and sometimes you need a way to um, exercise the information. Uh, for children, cold climates, I promise we're gonna get to easier stuff. Um, uh, Trayvon Martin, his killer is still doing amazing things. So when Trayvon Martin was murdered, um, I made this painting because I couldn't, I couldn't sleep. Um, and so I made him Coos Minion. So these are salmon people. These are salmon protectors. So the men at the top, men and women at the top are the faces and then they come down and they terminate in the salmon tail. And then this is over the earth. And so they're watching and protecting. Um, he made, his killer made the news again today, it's disgusting. Ballerina, all right, here we go. Here we get into the good stuff. Um, so I was given a Ford Fellowship to make prints out at Crow Shadow and um, I made 10 prints and this is the first one. Um, it's called Ballerina. I'm thinking of uh, Maria Tallchief who was a prima ballerina, which is by the way, a professional and artist and a professional athlete. Um, I was thinking about our prowess as athletes and dancers in the world. Um, you know, you guys have probably heard something about ancestral memory, and they talk about it mostly in terms of trauma, and certainly we do inherit that. But we also inherit uh, all of the good and powerful and amazing and magnificent things of our families. Everybody in the room is carrying everything, the good and the bad, that they got from the people they come from. And um, so, like I said, coming up, there wasn't a lot of direct, like this is what, how, this is a native thing, this is an Indian thing, it was just this is how we do things. And so, um, and a lot of our practices are hibernating. Um, but I, in my painting practice, you know, that's a meditative prayer. And so I have a really direct line to that voice inside my body and I just listen to it. Um, and I find stuff all the time on the street or in the mountains. And I was collecting feathers for a while and um, it was natural for me to bundle them like this and um, tie them with ribbon and I put them on my wall. And I didn't know why, but it just seemed like a logical organizational thing to do with them. 
And, um, and then I, I, in my printmaking practice, I work with uh, Xerox and as my camera. So I put objects in the Xerox machine and then I make prints of that and integrate it with Litho. Um, and so it was natural to grab one of those bundles and put it in here. Um, later on, I found out, well, later on before this print, I found out that um, that's part of our dance regalia. They're not feather dusters. We carry those kind of uh, dance bundles of the feathers. And so it was a really beautiful um, gift for, that I consider a gift from my ancestors that um, I, I had the message to collect it like this and put them on my wall in this way. And so that's kind of the background on this one. This piece, uh, Whale Crow, Knee and Bone, is to speak to masculine beauty um, and to lift up men. Um, I think that oftentimes there's such division and, and somebody has to be mad at somebody all the time and that kind of kills me. And I um, am a fan of everybody, all the genders, and uh, we really need to lift our men up as well. And so these, these two are companions, they go together. Um, those, uh, those are driftwood the two objects. Um, there's one that looks like a little whale and one that looks like a knee bone. Or, um, good luck, love, and money. Uh, so this is a lovely way to sign off with a friend when you're going to do something else. I had a girlfriend a long time ago. That's how she used to say goodbye. And it, it moved me. Um, and so this is a uplifting piece. Uh, the circular um, motif you'll recognize from my painting and then later on you'll see it in the installation. Um, below is a bandana that a friend gave me when I was crying um, and it is a bundle of dentalium. So dentalium is a shell. Um, in indigenous culture it's considered money and it's not like land money. It's a, it's a mark of cultural esteem and community love and that you have good relationships with people. We use it as a gift and a trade item so that's a a, a bunch of money there. Um, first basket. So um, I was working for the Portland Art Museum and I was helping them update their stuff. We had a new curator back then, Dr. Dina Dart, who had been brought on and she needed some community um, fine art experts. Um, and so Lillian Pitt, who is an important mentor of mine, brought me in and she said that the D uh, Dina should talk to me and so I started working with Dina and helping her. Um, through that I got to go to very fancy things and had like exceptional privileges that um, were not everyday kind of stuff. So I got invited to an induction ceremony for a raven's tail robe which is a Klingit masterpiece. Uh, it was made by Dr. Terry Rothbar who was a Klingit master weaver. She passed a couple years ago too. So she'd made this incredible robe um, that she danced it into the collection that's ceremonial. And in the middle of that ceremony, I had a conviction that it was time for me to start to pursue my traditional culture in weaving. Um, I realized at that point that I had the discipline and the resources with the museums and then all the knowledge holders that I was now having access to to start to put this together. As I mentioned, the 1850s were a hard time for us. And at that point, all of our material culture and the outward affected, uh, the outward showing marks of our cultures began to hibernate. So the language, the, cult, the regalia, the basketry, painting, all of those things went underground. And so that's, you know, 160, 170 years ago, these things have been asleep. But I started to see that everything that I had been doing up to this point um, sort of put me in a good position to start to collect this. So I started to tell the, the elders that I was around that I was ready to start doing it and then all of a sudden the resources and the funding started flying in. I made this basket at my tribe. Uh, they hired a local person who's not a tribal member to come in and teach a class. Um, that was the last one for her. And um, I made this basket, it's, I've repeated it three times. Um, and so this is to commemorate that moment of us beginning. Now let's get into the baskets. Um, so as it was mentioned, and I'll tell you about that in a moment, I did this um, because I run a weaving program for my tribe. Um, coming up as a painter, as an artist who makes this abstract work, my ambition was that it would be good for my people if when they were young, coming into a museum, they could see coos on the wall that would give them esteem. And I figured that that was as much as I could hope to do with my life. If I could get my work into those places, that would be a pretty big accomplishment. Um, and so that kind of set fire to 
my ambition, but then it, in that ceremony, I realized I could do this whole other thing and bring this whole other thing home, which would be a, a bigger deal. And so um, I began pursuing our knowledge um, in weaving. Uh, I studied with the Grand Ronde, Greg Archuleta, the Grand Ronde, and Greg A. Robinson, the Chavant Nation, are my teachers. They're here in Portland. So I spent a couple years going to their groups once a week and learning how to weave, how the Grand Ronde folks do it. And then I, go, I would go into all the museum collections and look at the coos baskets and reverse engineer to find out how to make all those things. I've had a, a bunch of really tremendous um, grants and support from a bunch of different entities that I'll share with you on paper. I'm going to mess up their names. So just there's been a ton of people behind this. Oregon Community Foundation, Evergreen Longhouse, Potlatch Fund, uh, the um, Andy Warhol Foundation. There's a bunch of them, and I'm forgetting people, and I'm really sorry, you guys, because um, we're recording this. Um, the Oregon Community Foundation gave me a Creative Heights grant, not last year, but the year before. And there was three parts. One, to run the weaving program. Two, to help my um, tribe work on some curatorial stuff that we're working on, I may tell you about. And then third was my studio work. So we have a language document in one of the um, anthropologist's notes that gives us 45 basket terms and descriptions and language, but no images, no nothing that goes with it. And so part of that grant was that I would create 15 of our baskets. And I'm starting the base catalog, so that's like a job that I'm working on right now. So in this, I'm going to show you about 10 of them. This one's called Bonita Mestiza. I have a Mexican grandmother, so I'm saying hello to her with naming it that. It's pretty mixed. Um, this is a clam basket. In terms of the master artist, your first work where you um, hold all the moves of art history, and then you make a new statement, that's your first masterpiece. So this would be my first masterpiece basket. Um, this is based on baskets that are held at the U of O. Um, this motif that's in the architecture um, of that kind of heart pattern in it. Coos would be the only people who do that in this way. Um, this is a spruce root basket. When it's wet, it is strong enough to hold 40 clams. This is a really, really um, high-end basket. Uh, an exciting thing to point out about um, contemporary indigenous art is that while it is absolutely have, has everyday use, it still qualifies in all of the register of fine art in the Western canon, which we can get into, you know, when we're not talking about so many other stories. Um, so that's the first one. That's uh, Bonita Mestiza. This is Ricky Infinity. Uh, it's at the Portland Art Museum right now. I made that the week that, um, well, the month that Rick was dying. It's in an exhibition that's honoring Lillian Pitt. It's been there for two years. It'll probably be there a little bit longer. Um, that's a storage basket. I can dry medicine with this as well. Um, smoke on the water. Um, it's a little berry basket. Uh, that blue-gray there, that is mud dye from our, where our origin story comes from, so the place of beginning. Um, and that's also hemlock dye. This one belongs to the Halley Ford Museum. It's a winnowing basket. It's about this big. Uh, it's, again, it's spruce root. Um, it's got a huckleberry dye in there, too. This one is a crawdad trap, sci science fiction crawdad trap we used to eat from the stream. It's the shape of a cooling tower for nuclear power. Um, this one is interesting in that um, I can't find a crawdad trap in any collection, so I really have to invent this. Um, but I'm familiar with them a lot. They're like tiny lobsters for people who don't know. And um, I grew up looking for them a lot. And uh, so what I was thinking about is like a rotting log, making this look like a rotting log. So it's got cedar bark, so they won't smell it. It's got that mud dye. It'll have another piece that goes on top. It's been in several exhibitions. It's at Evergreen right now in, in a show. Um, this is an eagle feather basket. So um, it's got bear grass in it. That's what that shimmery white is. It's, there's some bear grass out there that's related to the one in this basket. This is an interesting thing I bring in for a political conversation. So um, Native people are allowed to have eagle feathers, but we have to have a permit from the US government, and they want to have issued us the feathers that they get from roadkill, which is, it's OK. This has a feather in it. It has my permit in it. But I would question if you maybe were a Christian, and did you have to have a permit for your Bible? You know, there's things that are odd about that. 
and it cuts both ways. I'm glad the eagles are protected. It's really good, and th those kind of protections are in there for multiple reasons, but there's things in there, you know, that are kind of weird. So that's something we're talking about, <laughs> or at least bringing up to think on for later. Um, this one is Huckleberry Pie Forever. It's also in an exhibition. It's been on display for about three years solid right now. It's a cooking basket. So um, it's ceremonial because um, it has bear grass embedded in it and this motif. This is my first basket that has uh, that this kind of motif drawing on the basket. And it goes back to that Terry Rothgar friend of mine who told me that all of weaving is binary code, so a two number system. So this was the longest drawing I've ever done. <laughs> it was the slowest, most painful, and also most gratifying. It's based on a geologic formation in the Umpqua River where I am from like my childhood. Um, the way the rocks cooled there um, is in this kind of diamond pattern. It's also where the grass that I made that part of the green part of this basket is found. Um, and if you will remember back to that little medicine pouch I showed you, that motif was on there. And I didn't remember seeing that. It was lately that I went back and saw it and I was like, oh, so my grandmothers had things to say. Um, this purple there is a huckleberry dye. Um, Pakenich, which is one of our tribal lakes. Um, and then the body is spruce root. This is a woman's work cap. It's mine. Um, it's the first cap I made that I've worn. Um, and we'll get into caps in a minute. I want to keep an eye on. Okay, we're running out of time. Um, it's for a dance apron. It's pretty big. Tobacco pouch. This is the first basket I was able, ever able to weave where I had a historic basket in hand. I don't own any of our baskets. Our baskets are in collections. We have a few, and we're working to hopefully one day bring these home. Um, but I work with an antique dealer in town here. Um, he finds our baskets, and then I buy them for the tribe. And this, I got a tobacco pouch, and I got to hold it for a little while, and I made this one with it. And I will tell you, it is another world to be with these things. Um, from our perspective, these baskets are living beings. I'm going to quote, quote, Trevino brings plenty here um, to say that uh, the baskets contain our skin and our hair, and that's DNA, and it's living. It's commingled with the plant's DNA that this is made out of. So this is a collaboration between two living entities, and that doesn't go anywhere. So these are living beings. So we think of them as our grandmothers, and we speak to them. And when we hold them, we're having a conversation with them. Um, so, and if you think about that from a collection standpoint, you think about in those museums, there are rooms four times as big as this, filled with shelves that go up and up, and they're jammed packed with all of these grandmothers who maybe didn't even like each other, who have to be next to each other, and they're not at home with their people that they want to be comforting and educating and those things. There are libraries, there are encyclopedias, there are laboratories, there are colleges, there are all these things. And so this was a really special moment for me, getting to have this in hand. Um, uh, this is a thing at PSU. We are running a little short on time. Um, I'm going to skip it. Um, so this is where I met Mac. This is at the Craft Museum, 2015, um, State of Oregon Crafts. This is the beginning of my weaving school for my community. Um, a cat is called cash one wealth item a uh, wealth item for a tribe is a cash of anything uh, and this is a tremendous amount of work you're looking at each one of these bundles is like probably two weeks worth of work um, from the work I do in government to government I've got to contact people find out if I can do the thing I visit the site throughout the year then the actual gathering day then the processing day all that kind of stuff so this was in an exhibition that I was included in that summer, 2015. I opened the school in September. This was another one of the caches. This one was at PSU um, in an exhibition with Roger Pete called Something About Appropriation. Uh, he did a thing. It was weird. Um, none of his collaborators were felt resolved. I, we don't need to go into that. But I, I wanted to do something to counter the work. And so I asked him if I could have some space and he said yes. Um, so there's an occupation of space thing here going on, a little bit of a political um, metaphor for land, um, claiming land. Uh, so this one's called um, Cash 2, an indigenous strategy to counteract the mainstream cultural appropriation urge. It's a little bit of a mouthful. Um, this was the soft part of our cash. Um, 
and it was in July of 2015. Then in September, this is at the Portland Art Museum. So one of the things I helped them do was design the new contemporary gallery there for indigenous art. It's the only one of its kind in the region. Um, and I was in the inaugural show with my two teachers. And I have three parts in the show, but I think I'm just showing you the one today. This one's called Crowns of Medicine. So our fancy hats, our crowns are made out of these two materials. And then on the far right, those are um, mugwort and um, honey, uh, pearly everlasting, which tastes like and smells like bit of honey. Those two plants are let off a lot of smell, and those are to soothe the um, hearts of the viewers, because there's a lot of hard stuff going on in this exhibition. Um, so that's what that one is. This one I'm really proud of. It's called Homecoming Cash. So I created a sustainable cash for my community, so we always have ready roots. The roots and the cedar bark like to season for about a year, and I don't want anybody to have to wait that long. So when anybody is ready to weave, I take them out, they dig their own roots, and then they swap them out with the roots here. So they're continually having things ready to go, but they're also contributing to the next upcoming group. It's pretty fun. It's also, as a side note, in one of our boardrooms. So government to government meetings happen in the presence of this. And then all of those events are embedded into these roots and the cedar bark then becomes part of the story of those baskets. The reservoir continues. Um, this is the next year at PSU. Um, those collaborators that I mentioned, Sharita Town, Demian Deneyazi, Sky Hopinka, Gabe Flores, and myself decided to do the show again. That I don't know where Roger was. So we did the show again, and this year, um, these were the baskets that my students made with that cash that you saw the year before. And this cash my students helped me collect. So this is after the um, weaving school is live, and then it's happening. So it's, it, it looks very simple and quiet, but it turns out to be a, a huge... Um, moment of overcoming genocide. So we have brought our culture back together and we're moving forward with that. Um, let me tell you about that one. This one's good. It's a continuum. So this one, 40,000 fourth graders learn their Oregon history by seeing this exhibition. So the top row are those historic baskets at the U of O I mentioned. The middle row are mine and the bottom two are my apprentice, Ashley Russell, who's a millet coos woman. Um, those are her baskets. And the exciting thing about her is she has three children who come to all the workshops, so they're learning this and it's back. And that's the, been the big goal, is that the kids coming up don't remember when they learned how to do it. They're just like, yeah, we always done this. This is what we do. You know, that's the goal and that's how they're growing up. So this exhibition or this um, installation I created at the U of O Historical Museum is a huge deal in, in what it holds, but also in what it did already. The work that it just did is a super big deal. Um, this is a lot of these things are about relationships. So that painting in the background is called Caviar for Winter Food. And um, this woman who's dancing in the fur dress uh, was a graduate student, and this was her graduate work. So she wanted to create contemporary dance based on um, traditional and contemporary stories. So Caviar for Winter Food is a painting that I made that tells the story of the Umatilla taking back their land management and that they've brought back several varieties of the wild salmon that have been completely knocked out in that area. So it's to say that when given back land management, we've been very successful with it. Um, they created a two hour dance performance. Uh, they went with it and this is part of it. I also really like that there's a woman in the foreground with the cell phone. I think it's important to notice all the time we are all around you in this contemporary world doing things just like you. Um, this one is at Missoula. So those three prints, I'm gonna do this quickly because I know we have a long way to go. Um, the print on the far side, that's um, called prayer. So I have my hand and a fist. The one in the middle is unarmed. So I'm holding, I'm holding an invisible gun and my hands up here are in the don't shoot posture. This work is to um, push back against police brutality against people of color. The sales from these prints go to um, Black Lives Matter and Standing Rock. I, I, I made them during Standing Rock, which is, you know, it's an interesting time of year for that to remember. Um, yeah, this was just an, an exhibition at Missoula. These were made at the Matrix residency out there too. So master printer Jim Bailey made these for me. When You guys, I'm, I think I'm gonna skip here a little bit. Um, I'll tell you this one and then I'll get into the caps, um, which brings us into what we're doing here. 
So I don't know if you guys grew up with um, Oregon Trail video game. They put it in the schools. It was fun. Where in the world's Carmen San Diego? That kind of stuff. It was fun, but it was screwed up from the native perspective uh, every single day of it. Um, and so a girlfriend of mine who is a, she has a PhD in video science, video making science. She came up here. Elizabeth Lapney, her mother teaches at PSU as well. She is recreating that game from the indigenous perspective. And so you start, I think it's a Lakota guy on the East Coast and he travels all across the country and he comes and he hangs out with all the tribes. And so she commissioned all of her favorite people all over the country to write those stories. And so when she came to me and asked, she was like, do you want to do this? I was like, well, yeah, of course. I don't like video games, but you know, whatever. And, um, and then she's like, and it's set in the 1850s. I was like, uh-uh, I don't tell that story. I hate that story. That's a horrible story. And she's like, okay, well, what about doing the plants? I was like, I can tell you five plant stories, no problem. That sounds great. So um, when the guy gets to us, he encounters Spider Woman, who's naturally a weaver. And I take them through spruce fruit, uh, let's see, what else? Salmonberry, poison oak, nettles, um, something else. Anyway, and so she's working with another indigenous artist, and this is the salmonberry one. So watch out for that. That will also be in the public schools in like a year or two. Yeah, we're really excited about it. Be fun. Okay, I told you about historic baskets um, workshop. So I'm sharing with you some pretty sweet stuff now. Um, these are the workshops. We're working really well. There's something um, extremely special about what we're doing down there. Um, I go down to Coos Bay uh, six to 12 times a year to lead these workshops, and we've got all the generations there. This is us at our sweat house. Um, that's Talis. It's one of Ashley, my apprentice sons. Um, this is Carolyn. We just lost her last week. That's a big deal. Um, we are so grateful that we got here in time to share this with her. Um, this woman in the 1980s with my grandfather and their contemporaries, they were the ones who got our federal rec recognition back. And so they fought through their whole lives to um, say who they were. They never passed. They always were really out about who we were and what we were doing. And they worked their whole lives to get that. So in the 1980s, 84, we got our, regained our tribal recognition. And so it's been the generation since then that we've all been working to put in whatever we could. And so that we were able to get this together by the time that she, in time, is um, one of the most graceful points of my life. So um, it's a little bit challenging for me to talk about this right now, um, but that's her. That's Carolyn Ramona Slider who got us here. So we love her. That's her son, the man in the gray t-shirt. He's also an elder. Um, we have salmon. <laughs> we eat salmon a lot. That's him. That's Doc. He uh, leads our sweat. and. Um, He's a family member of mine too. Jor he's from the Jordan clan, so all of our grandmothers are out there at Jordan Cove. Um, and there's something off about teaching an elder something, right? Like that, there's something backwards about that. But um, we make the best of it because there's a lot of joy to be had, you know? And so this is me teaching him how we take care of that stuff and do that. This is how these kids are growing up. Look at that. Isn't that beautiful? That's Talos' first uh, medallion. He really insisted for months that I teach him. I was like, all right, all right. And he just wouldn't, wouldn't quit asking, so we did it. That's her first basket. It's Talos making his first basket. And there she is watching on. See, this, is, this, is a, this makes me feel like I've done an okay job, that she saw this. You know, that's a big deal. Happy days. We don't have gender issues in our tribe. That's Scott. That's his dad. That's his grandmother who I'm speaking about. Look at that, right? Pretty beautiful. Those are sisters. That was a fun day. The first basket. First basket's a really significant thing. You have to give it away. I let them make a second basket before they have to give their first one away. But it's a protocol. So we have a lot of rules, you know, and you have to follow them. And the protocol in giving away your first is um, about gratitude. And it's also to ensure that you'll make more. 
So this is my apprentice. I brought her to the U of O. This is her first museum investigation to visit with those grandmothers. Um, this is a workshop I created at the Oregon Historical Society or the Oregon uh, Coos Historical Museum down there. That woman with the brown hair there, she is my um, main collaborator from all time. It's Margaret Corby. She's also a Hannes Coos woman. And she is the head of our natural resources and culture department. And she got that job like the day I started this project. And she's just been like, yep, yep, yep. And this woman right here with the little things in her hair, that's her mother. Um, who is also, all of those guys are my students. Um, and this is us visiting with the baskets at Coos Historical. Ashley bringing her basket to speak to that one. Um, this is that woman with the fur dress I shared with you. Um, so the Burke hired me to come up and look at their collections. And while I was doing that, then they asked if they could come down and teach us stuff. And I'm trying to help my community, my tribal government set up a curatorial facility part of our NAGPRA work, Native American Graves and Repatriation Act, came out in the 90s that says that museums have to give back our items. And part of that is that you have to have a facility to take them back. So I'm helping us to build one. Um, so in part of that effort, I do a lot of things for that, but part of it was I brought these guys down from the Burke. They brought a bunch of our baskets down and taught my um, tribal government how to clean them. So we can say we can do these things. And this is that day. This is how our kids grow up in that kind of thing. So this is a grant out of the Burke. And that's Justin. He's a Alaskan native. Um, let's see. This is bringing us into this exhibition, actually. So this is the plank house out at Ridgefield. So now I'm getting into the gathering practice. Um, so I create relationships with different entities, whether they're private landowners, federal government, state government. It's part of our sovereign right that we are allowed to do this, gather in places that most people can't. Um, but we have to go through a process. You have to get to know people, which is OK. That's no problem. I'll make relationships. Um, and one of them was actually directly related to this exhibition, because we're looking at the Columbia bioregion, right? Um, and so the Chinooks have a long-standing relationship with the, um, the Ridgefield um, place up there in Washington. It's a wildlife preserve. Um, and then the Chinooks have a plank house there. So I started working with them about a year ago in preparation for this to talk about how I could gather things at that place to bring home to this exhibition. So one of the rows of cattail out there was gathered in this place. Fairgrass, um, it's an item that indicates that the basket is ceremonial. Um, I've got some, the front, the first row that you run into out there is the bare grass. It looks blue, kind of green right now. It will become white. It will lose all that color and become this right luminous moon color on the caps. Um, this is in the Tillamook Forest. Um, to show you the process, I climb a mountain, I gather it, I pick it, then I have to process it down and clean it down. And that's, those are like four days there. It goes on and on, and then it goes here for a year, you know, it does a bunch of things. This is sedge, um, what the body of a lot of the caps are made with, cattail, and it's just such a beautiful way to live. I really love to show you guys these things because it's so um, calming how beautiful nature organizes itself. Um, so this is a cattail here. And here's the kids learning how to do it. <laughs> really good day. It's a really fun day. And I'm especially proud because they've all got their life jackets on and their, <laughs> and their boots and their things, you know. You don't have to edit anything out of this picture. I can just show it. Yeah, so um, a really lovely part of it is that when you're out in, in the natural environment, you get to be there when special things happen. This day was their first time having salmon berries. So this is the salmon berry. Um, that's her first day picking sedge. We're digging the mud at the place of beginning to make our blue gray. Sometimes the artist can't stop being artist. I used a shovel, but he used a rock. <laughs> uh, that's my apprentice. Here we are. That's three generations right there. Grandmother, mother, child. It's a big deal, you know. And we're doing this in the places our ancestors have been, you know. Uh, that's as proto-feminist. Um, that's Demi and Danae's bag there. Uh, that's original feminism, you know. That's he said that. Um, here we are doing our thing. Well, that's not me. That's Nicole Mendez. She's one of our tribal members. She's pregnant right there. So that's a big deal. And here we are. Um, so the cash. 
this is cash seven, this is us dancing, and the numbers are true. That means I've done six others, other places. So every year there's one or two, and I put them up. Um, so I'm occupying space. I'm also collaborating with you, whether you know it or not. Um, we think of these things as sponges. They collect everything that happens there. And so these plants are part of your daily life here as students. They're part of the community. Everything that's happening underneath them goes up into them. Those will be embedded in the baskets. When my students go to make things with these items, these will have already been elevated into the fine art discourse. They are already part of contemporary fine art and our contemporary history. So that all of this, the conversation we're having right now, that's part of it. This day happened. Um, one of the student groups here didn't like something that was going on there, and this is the kind of place where they get to work those ideas out in an artistic fashion and be in contact and conversation with everyone in their space. And I think that's really beautiful, and I think it's really powerful, and I'm extremely proud to have been absorbing part of that resistance that these um, incredible upcoming artists did, led by Victor Maldonado. The cats. So... Um, Another thing that I did last year, uh, Rebecca Dobkins is a um, professor at Willamette, and she also is the curator at the Halley Ford. She writes books, and she's been working on a book called The Artist Ceremony for a number of years, where she's looking at the nine tribes of Oregon and their ceremonial artistic practices. So she asked me to come, well, she used some of my photographs for us, and then last year she asked if I would come document the women getting ready for Nadosh, which is the Salet winter celebration. They dance for three days straight. And it's like an eight-hour deal where they put on different regalia. It's pretty magnificent. And so I got to be with the women, doc photo documenting them. Um, and I was really moved by how rich they are. And I don't mean rich like land dollars. I mean like their cultural richness. Um, they're in this beautiful wooden back room of their plank house and they come in in the morning with like two minivans filled with treasure like regalia dance caps and dresses and necklaces headdresses and the men have it too and they're filling up the house and then all day long the little girls and the grandmothers and everybody in between is like cinching up all of this stuff and um there is protocol from morning, noon, and night, and everyone knows exactly how to act, and they're really, it, it was magnificent, and I was really inspired by their accumulation of their um, cultural power, uh, and they've been working on, they're a little ahead of us, Bud Lane, Robert Kinta, and their families, they're their cultural leaders down there, and they've been building up that ceremony and that cache of regalia for about 30 years. And so it was another one of those like, oh, that's a clear direction. I should be following that. And so I decided to start working on these caps. And it came, you know, Mac and I started having this conversation a year and a half, a year ago. And I was, he's like, well, you know, what would you like to do? I'd like to see your cash. I was like, I would like to show you my cash. And then I was like, and I'm kind of working on these caps. And, you know, seven's a really good number. I'll try to make seven, which is stupid ambitious. Uh, <laughs> but I've gotten faster. Um, and so I started working on it. Um, and the idea is that for these caps, these will be for the youth um, that come to those weaving workshops. You saw some of the pictures of their beautiful faces and joyous experiences. And I want to lift them up in our community. Um, in the Coos, Laura, and Pont, I used to let people are, are banded together to have enough numbers to qualify as a federally recognized group. And we have a, almost a thousand, and we're spread out all over the place. We're we're pretty dislocated from each other, and um, and we but we do come together at least once a year for salmon ceremony. That's in August, and it's a really important time for me politically to show up and to represent to the community to say, hey, look, this is here for you. Come, come on, I want to teach you this stuff, and I really want the kids to get lifted up and recognize for what they're doing because it's really hard. I mean, weaving's really hard and they have to kind of be act right and wear their shoes and stuff, you know, and it's kind of boring maybe. I don't know. I think they're having a ball, but, you know, it's work. It's work. And I really want to honor them for that. And then there's also something really important about representing. And so for them to start doing that, it's part of their job and their responsibility and privilege and honor and all that stuff. And so having this regalia as part of it, you know, I didn't grow up with this. It feels kind of crazy for me to wear this stuff. I get a inhibition that is almost painful 
And that has also to do with trauma, right? Inherited trauma. Um, but for them, they won't feel like that. This will be natural for them if we start now. And it's working. And this is the first one. Uh, I made this last summer when the forest fire was happening in um, the river here. It was really sad, that poor kid, poor stupid kid. He's going to have to live with that forever. Uh, if you aren't familiar, there were some kids in the gorge playing with firecrackers, and they started a forest fire and really devastated a great area, the Eagle Creek area. And there's two problems there. I mean, there's many problems, but there's two reasons why it was so devastated. One, I mean, there's the global warming thing. There's that. And two, it's overmanaged. That area, because it's a recreational area, they don't let forest fires happen. They don't let the natural things that would happen to keep things in balance. And so it, it was more devastating than it really should have been. Um, so what I was thinking about, this one's called Pray for Rain. So what I was thinking about is all of that. And as a weaver, you know, I spend a lot of time up in those cliffs. And I know there's a lot of bear grass up there. And I'm sorry, I'm sorry if people I'm hurting their feelings, but you know, bear grass really loves fire and it comes back really nice after the fire. So I've always been like, wouldn't it be interesting if there was fires up there? So that will be something that's beautiful that comes from it. And you know, fire does a lot of other amazing things for forests. There are some seeds that will not grow until they go through a fire. Like there's a lot of magnificent things that we will find. And also nature's powerful powerful and it goes through this and it's part of a cycle and so we're going to find out a lot more about these places that are so dear to us than we knew when we just got here and it was easy and pristine the way we expected it to be so it's going to be a learning thing a lot of times love is a little bit more pain than we expected when we looked at the surface and it's going to be like that so that's what this one's about um, it's also important to note that um, this blue gray is the um, from the beginning the place the beginning and the yellow is Oregon grape root, which is a medicinal plant. So it is there for healing. There's a lot more to that, but we're going to keep moving. Um, this one is Talus's cap. Um, I made it, and I showed it to him, and I said, I think this one's for your sister. These are her colors. He's like, those are my colors. I was like, you're right. You're right. You got it. You got it. Um, this is the red-headed woodpecker cap. Um, it's got blacks from the Maoris in it. It's got that uh, red horse hair. It's from the Flathead Indian Reservation. A Salish Kootenai lady gave that to me, Linda King. It has the um, support of communi indigenous communities around the world for our kids. Um, I've never seen a cap like this before. Um, and it's my first time using animal, animal in it. Um, and she gave that to me out in Montana when I was at that exhibition. And in the plane, it like I already knew what to do with it on the way home in the plane. I, I kind of visualized this one. And when that happens, I just try to be of service and I get out of the way. So and when I was making it, I was so nervous. I was like, nobody's going to want to wear this. This is crazy. And I was so wrong. You're going to see in a minute. Like, they, th this is the right thing to do. Um, that's the little little brother's cap. It goes with the other one. This one. And all of our relations. So it's got four canoes on it. It refers to canoe culture. So there's a canoe journey thing that goes on every year. If you don't know about it, look it up. I don't want to take any more of your time to tell you about it because it's a whole nother thing. Um, but what I do need to tell you about this cap, it's made from um, spruce root from the north spit of Jordan Cove. Jordan Cove is where we are most likely going to see the biggest ecological disaster in this region, and we're going to probably see it pretty soon. The last 10 years, there's been a pipeline project that wants to go through there. Uh, it is in a tsunami zone. Um, I don't have to be a scientist to know that it's a super bad idea to put a pipeline through a tsunami earthquake area in an enormous wetland. Um, so a basket like this may be the last one we're going to see like this because when that happens, all of that area, that uh, ancient ecosystem is going to be destroyed. Um, when I go to sites in this area, I can find 45 medicine and cultural use plants within like one minute. Those are ancient cultivations. Those gardens can't be replaced. They can't be moved. That happened over thousands of years of occupation. We know that we've been living in that place since the beginning of human existence on this continent, which comes before any land bridge. <laughs> and so it's really, really old. And um, I'm trying to make things with that right now to hold this moment in our history so I can tell you you can't unsee this, okay? This may be the last one we're going to see. It's precious. Um, yeah, there's that one. Uh, the, the blue cap. Um, blue jay cap, I've got another story, but I don't have time for it. Um, this is the baby's cap. 
So um, the woman I said was pregnant, um, that's the first baby to come into our weaving um, workshop. So she was pregnant with this baby. It's called Sequoia Ren Mendoza, woven in utero. Um, the children helped me figure out the top, how many um, dentalium were going to be in there. And if you'll remember that medicine bag, same deal. I didn't do that on purpose. It was just an obvious way for those beads to go together. And then that kind of goes back to how we would have always done it. Um, so this baby cap, very sweet, very sweet. Yeah. Yeah, and here's where it gets really good. Look, she was not at all embarrassed of that cap. They're like, give it to me, and they're so confident, and it's so beautiful, and I'm so happy to share it with you. Um, this is a really, really great time for us, you know? And um, there's a lot going on in Indian country, and it's really exciting because the Western world seems to kind of care and want to hear about it. So we are happy to bridge the gap. Um, and this is the first time that we've worn caps like this in salmon ceremony. So get a load of that. Um, Mac is going to help me do my last move. I'm not going to deconstruct the arrowhead stuff for you today because I'm just going to not do it. Um, we're going to talk about that another time. Um, and I have one more thing I want to share with you because it's way better than anything I can say. Thanks so much, Sarah. We will, um, we're going to move on to Ryan Griffiths and Sarah Ross, and then we will do Q&A after, yeah, um, uh, with all three. And as I said before, now is the time when you won't see anything happening up here. You'll just uh, be focusing to my lovely voice. Um, so I'm, it's, it was really amazing to be able to work with Sarah Seastream on this exhibition. Uh, and really the mapping project the first, and then it was became very obvious that we should bring uh, this entire exhibition, the Earl Clamata Bide, uh, which had been in Chicago prior to this at Gallery 400 at the University of Chicago. Um, and then it actually traveled to Carbondale, uh, a town with a very auspicious name to have an exhibition called the Earl Clamata Bide. And then it, in through that process, it. Uh, Ryan and Sarah are both really involved with the exhibition writ large, and then it just became very fantastic to try to bring them here, uh, in part because it's a bit of a return. They, uh, they both lived here uh, for a few years and um, did some work in town. Um, and so uh, we will hear from them about the exhibition, uh, the work that they have in the exhibition and the work that they do together, and then a little bit about uh, their individual's practices, which they also have. Uh, Sarah Ross. Uh, is a mini media artist um, whose work uh, really addresses uh, various concerns uh, through a, a consideration of the body into space um, and then getting into issues around class, uh, anxiety, and activism. Um, she teaches at the School of Art Institute in Chicago. Um, she also works collaboratively with the Chicago Torches Justice Memorials and is also the co-founder of the Prison and Neighborhood Arts Project. Um, two really amazing uh, projects where she's working on around people dealing with police torture, survivors of police torture, as well as uh, individuals uh, who are, are currently incarcerated. Um, she's also co-curated exhibitions at things at, at organizations such as Space Gallery in Cleveland, Ohio, um, also at Sea and Space Exploration in Los Angeles. Um, she is currently an Open Society Foundation fellow, which uh, if you don't know about the Open Society Foundation, check it out. Uh, it's a pretty amazing and very relevant in today's news. Um, and she has shown work in 
many, many places, including Roots and Culture in Chicago, uh, Pinkard Gallery in Baltimore, and the Canadian Center for Architecture in Montreal. Ryan Griffiths, uh, here to my left, uh, is uh, currently uh, teaching at the School of Art and Design at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. And his work uh, has a lot of different uh, facets to it, but really has a direct an intense focus on the political ecology of the region in which he is living, uh, the Midwest, um, which you can see in this exhibition, um, and as well as his work uh, under the moniker Temporary Travel Office, uh, who has an in a mission to investigate the potential of tourism as a critical activity. Um, and I would highly recommend checking out that website uh, if once you get a taste of what's going on here, uh, these series of walks and publications and displays uh, that deal with the idea of the tourist as, as a site of criticality. Um, and they've realized projects at the Mac Center and the Center for Land Use Interpretation, uh, one of my favorite organizations, actually. Um, Ryan also, which I just learned uh, yesterday, is the coordinating the Art in These Times, uh, which is a venue on the west side of Chicago, um, which is the magazine um, uh, in these times, and uh, is, a, is a, an amazing venue, and if you're ever in Chicago, please go by that very strange uh, venue that has incredible uh, exhibitions and programs. Uh, and Ryan is also a writer and has written for such things as um, Cities and um, Inequities, uh, Rutledge 2015, and Support Next Works, Support Networks, uh, Chicago Social Practice History Series, uh, published by the University of Chicago Press in 2014. Please help me welcome uh, Ryan Griffiths and Sarah Ross. Uh, thank you uh, so much, Mac, for the introduction and for uh, bringing uh, The Earth Will Not Abide here, uh, and thank you, Sarah, for your talk, but also especially for your contribution to the show, which is really moving uh, in both its uh, uh, critical intervention uh, in, into these discussions, uh, but also very generous. Um, and hopefully <laughs> the exhibition uh, introduces some kind of good energy, uh, even though a lot of uh, what's in it is, is not always positive. Uh, it certainly is trying to move towards something more positive. Um, uh, so. Uh, I have this picture up here uh, that, that is uh, Sarah and I, uh, along with a group of other people. Um, uh, and this is on an organic farm uh, outside of Champaign-Urbana uh, called the Tomines Farms that's uh, run by uh, a former uh, nuclear physicist uh, who, who quit um, that world to be an organic farmer named Lisa Haynes. Uh, and I have it because it's uh, this group of people, uh, uh, some of whom are in the show, uh, uh, Claire Pentecost, Brian Holmes, uh, and Sarah Lewison um, are also in, in this picture somewhere. Um, we've been working together for a long time, and there's a lot to say about that, that collective work, um, but uh, in many ways it, it sort of came out of uh, trying to understand who a lot of us uh, are in the spaces that we live. Um, they're not spaces that we're from. Um, very few of us, a, a couple of people are from um, you know, what's now called the Midwest uh, in the U.S., but most of us are, are more recent migrants from other parts of the country. Um, but trying to figure out collectively um, who we are and where we are um, as, uh, uh, you know, um, settlers uh, in this space um, and how to live in that space. And so that particular group uh, has undertaken a lot of different projects, which I won't really uh, go into um, too much, but um, they... They have been the production of, of maps uh, included in exhibitions uh, like this one, um, uh, publications uh, that have included sort of an extended network, uh, uh, not just the sort of smaller group of about 15 of us, but a larger group. Um, and Sarah and I also uh, uh, several years ago started a, another project called Regional Relationships that was another way in which we um, tried to um, invite people to create projects, um, uh, not for exhibitions or for sort of uh, grounded spaces, but uh, sending things directly to uh, people. So the exhibition sort of happened uh, in the space of the US Postal Service uh, for the most part um, and ended up in people's mailboxes. Um, and so sort of thinking about regional geographies um, has been a big part uh, of both the Compass Group, which is that larger 
uh, collective, so to speak, but also something that Sarah and I have um, taken in sort of offshoots uh, of that larger collective work. Um, so uh, right now I'm gonna try to give kind of a little bit of a brief background into the work that's in the exhibition um, that Sarah and I co contributed called The Great Green Desert. Um, and as you can see in the show, uh, it employs a variety of forms to try and document and understand uh, one of the most dominant forms of land use in the U.S. Midwest. Um, how many people have ever been to the Midwest? Chicago, Illinois, Indiana, parts of Ohio. Yeah, so uh, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, if you've ever driven uh, even on the major highways, um, you're surrounded by uh, corn, um, which is the, you know, the most uh, commonly referred to crop, but also uh, soybeans. Um, uh, and as you can also see um, in the exhibition uh, with this particular uh, project, um, this form of land use isn't contained uh, within the U.S. Midwest. Um, so I'm going to try to narrate uh, a little bit um, in, in a more explicit way um, some of the background behind the images that, that you'll see, uh, especially in the video uh, work that's in the show. So in 2010, uh, while we were working on a different but related project that Sarah's going to discuss uh, in a bit, uh, we found ourselves in a harvester, um, although we didn't exactly find ourselves in a harvester. Sarah kind of talked our way into them. Um, the field that, that you see that we're in um, here is several miles east of the Illinois River, and it's a field of corn that looks exactly like most of the surrounding landscape. Uh, the drivers, uh, the people who we're riding with, uh, are two brothers, the Dudleys, who farm corn on 7,000 acres of mostly rented land. They tell us that this crop is for the export market, mostly for Japan, and is what they call a specialty crop because it's not genetically modified. This corn will be shipped down the Mississippi River into ports outside New Orleans, where it will be loaded into massive seagoing vessels. Over several meetings, they tell us about the pressures of increasing land consolidation, skyrocketing rents, and the crazy economics of commodity crop farming. In Illinois in 2016, the average return on corn per acre was about $710, while the expenses per acre averaged $810. When you hear about subsidies, this is why they exist. But those subsidies aren't really for the benefit of the farmer, but are for the buyers of the corn and soy that they produce. Surrounding the Dudley's fields of specialty corn are thousands of acres more of corn and soy, most of which is genetically modified. The buyers of most of this corn, the real beneficiaries of the subsidies, are large processors and traders, companies like ADM, Bungie, and Cargill. So much of these crops are produced that it's often temporarily stored outside in large mounds rather in silos, rather than in silos. The mound that you see here uh, is a mound of corn owned by Cargill next to the Illinois River. Images like this recall the tailing and waste piles of mining operations. And in fact, corn and soy farming more closely resembles a form of strip mining that requires very little human labor, relying instead on mostly chemical and mechanical labor. Corn and soy aren't the valuable material being mined. The valuable material is the land, soil, and water. 90% of this corn that you see here is destined for confined animal feedlots, where chickens, hogs, and cattle are kept alive for the shortest possible time before being sent to slaughter. About one mile away from this pile, Cargill also operates a plant that slaughtered and packaged 18,000 hogs per day. It's now run by a Brazilian company named JBS. In the 1940s, the architectural theorist Siegfried Gideon noted the connection between the early 20th century boom in slaughterhouses and the surplus production of corn as a commodity with fluctuating prices. In the economics of agribusiness, the dead flesh of hogs is simply an efficient way to sell a given amount of corn for more money. What doesn't go to domestic confined feedlots will be shipped internationally to ports around the world and used for animal feed there. This machine that you're looking at is called a continuous barge unloader, and each of the buckets you see holds about 1,500 pounds of corn or soy. It moves about 4 million pounds per hour and operates around the clock almost all year long. This one's at a grain loading terminal on the Mississippi River in Louisiana, operated by a cooperative called CHS. It's loading soybeans into a ship bound for China, now the largest importer of soy, that imported 86 million metric tons in 2017, mostly from the U.S. and Brazil. So where did the land for all of that soy and corn come from? 
what was there before all of that land was turned into the largest strip mine in the world. Iowa and Illinois are at the center of this land, often called the Corn Belt, for the obvious reason that it's dominated by the fields of corn we've been talking about and more recently, soybeans. The terrain owes its flatness and geology to the Wisconsin glaciation period that ended around 10,000 years ago. That geology, along with the interventions of non-humans like bison and human and weather-induced fires, created and maintained a grassland ecosystem that some have called the Grand Prairie of North America. It's known for nutrient-rich soil and communities of grasses and forbs that have incredibly deep root systems that are up to 10 feet deep. When European settlers encountered this region in the 19th century, they often compared their first experiences in Tallgrass Prairie to that of being lost in a great green sea. Standing in the middle of tall grasses, it's not hard to see why. The prairie was also often extremely muddy and even swamp-like, making it very difficult to traverse. The settler experience was rooted in a combination of awe and frustration. It also revealed their indifference or even hostility to the life that existed there. Through massive state-sponsored hydroengineering projects and the John Deere plow, the grasslands were drained and plowed over. Agriculture was a means of settler colonial expansion, of turning the land into something manageable by states. What prairie you can still see in the upper Midwest is almost certainly a restored prairie, like the Nechisa grasslands that you can see here, acquired and planted by the Nature Conservancy. But these areas function more like living dioramas than they do full-fledged ecosystems. By the beginning of the 20th century, less than one one-hundredth of a percent of the 22 million acres of these grasslands remained in the st state of Illinois, uh, which is still unironically known as the prairie state. Those farmers we met earlier, the Dudleys, they once told us about an Illinois farmer they knew who had set up a corn and cotton farm in Brazil. While we had heard agricultural economists talk about the weather in South America, we had never really looked into it. In 2016, we were awarded a grant, uh, the same grant that allowed us to put this exhibition together, and decided to find out more about what was being called the soy frontier in the center west part of Brazil. You might have thought the image we were just looking at was another shot of us riding on a farm in Illinois, but it's somewhere near the town of Sinop in the state of Mato Grosso in western Brazil. These farms are called fazendas or plantations in Brazil, and most would dwarf U.S. corn and soy farms. And unlike the single corn and soy growing season in the U.S. Midwest, this region of Brazil produces three to four annual crops of corn and soy. Most of the soybeans grown here are for export to China, however domestically consumed biodiesel. Just as the U.S. Midwest had to be plowed and drained, the land in central Brazil also had to be made suitable for monocropping. State-sponsored research in the U.S. and Brazil led to the development of a tropical soybean variety in the middle of the 20th century, and the acidic soil is made subservient with large amounts of fertilizers, pesticides, and lime. Sinop, an agricultural boomtown first colonized by European Brazilians in the 1970s, is at the western edge of an eco-region known as the Sahado. A neotropical savanna, the Sahado covers a quarter of Brazil and is South America's sec second largest biome after the Amazon forest. Scientists refer to the Sahado often as an inverted forest, as they estimate 70% of the biomass of living vegetation there is underground, much like the extinct tall grass prairies of the U.S. Midwest. It's an extremely biodiverse region. It's occupied by more than 80 indigenous groups and feeds eight of Brazil's 12 hydrographic regions, including, and, and, sorry, influencing atmospheric and groundwater throughout South America. When we interviewed conservation scientists with the Chico Mendes Institute in Brasilia, they told us that the non-indigenous public doesn't have much appreciation for the region. Just like the U.S. prairie, European, European Brazilian settlers described it as an empty space and many still view it that way. This is reflected in national policy. The Brazilian Forest Code mandates preservation of 80% of the Amazon forest, but only 25, 20 to 35% of the Sahado grasslands. More than half of the Sahado biome has already been deforested and it continues to lose about 6,000 kilometers annually. This is a plant just outside of Chicago. It's operated by a company named Ingredien which is the perfect name for an evil corporation in a science fiction film. <laughs> Since 1904, when it was known by the more anodyne name, Corn Products International, it has invented many industrial uses for corn, including high fructose corn syrup. 
They're in the business of providing what they call ingredient solutions, converting corn and other plantation crops like palm oil into sensory experiences such as mouthfeel. And Greedown is just one site where you can see, hear, smell, and maybe taste the tensions between the complex system of industrial agriculture and the simplified ecosystems on which they thrive. One of the company's many slogans is the invitation to enter the world of endless possibilities. One of the people I interviewed for the project that you can listen to in the show is a Brazilian geographer named Gustavo Oliveira. He calls soy a flex crop, a material that capitalist agribusiness can use to produce an endless number of products that can shift depending on fluctuating profit margins. He goes on to say, however, that such a system only makes sense if you have a virtually endless amount of land devoted to that single plant or a small range of plants. One can only enter their world of endless possibilities by sacrificing everything else in that world. The field of political ecology asks us to recognize that land and the life ways that depend on it becomes degraded unless as much is returned as is taken. Clearly, the monocropping of corn and soy in the US and Brazil is designed to extract as much value from the land as possible while returning nothing. People also exist on and with land, so we have to ask how this degradation also applies to us. How do these systems of degradation impact our relationships with our human and non-human cohabitants? Another project that we completed just before a great green desert took up that question in some very direct and specific ways. And that's what uh, Sarah is gonna pick up on now. Um, thanks so much for having us. Um, hang on, Maya, I don't understand how this works. <laughs> how does it fit me? Oh, no. Okay, yeah, okay. Fine. This is his computer, not mine, so I'm a little off. Um, but um, thanks so much for having us. Um, so we're gonna, um, we have defied a little bit of Max's um, request and that we're just gonna talk about one other project. Um, but it was many years in the making um, because, uh, you know, like um, the first Sarah spoke about, I mean, th these projects are really long-term and trying to sort of find our way um, through doing, through talking with people. And um, for students who are here, um, just thinking about, I guess, one of the ways that we work, um, Ryan and I both, um, is, is thinking about kind of a research-based practice. I mean, we're not from this um, uh, part of the country where we now live, and it, f and it has felt like a pretty foreign place. So part of our work has tried to figure out like what that place is um, through different sort of registers of history and political economy. So. Um, a, a project that we did uh, before the work that you see in the gallery started in this town called Beardstown, Illinois. Um, and um, we were interested in this space because um, of some ongoing conversations we had had um, and collaborations with an urban planning scholar um, named Firanak Miraftab. Um, and her work was, wi was with um, recent immigrant communities in Beardstown. And Beardstown was about two and a half hours from where we lived at the time. Um, we were interested in this town and Farinock's work um, because um, the, the projects that Ryan showed early on with this group called the Compass Group, um, one of the things that we were interested in is like um, how something like the global shows up in the rural. Um, so it's not necessarily the cosmopolitan, that would be more like city, but how, how globalization, how you can see it in a cornfield or how you can see it in, in a place that looks rural. Um, and these were some questions that were being asked um, with this project that Brian Holmes had started called Continental Drift. Um, so, and so Farinock was doing this work by looking at this um, small town uh, called Beardstown. Um, and um, so we were under, you know, started to think about um, why this building would bring so many people from across, across the globe to a small rural, t rural town with really deep racist histories. Um, and so in order to, to do this work, we first needed to understand the land around it, which was a lot of what Ryan was talking about. We started looking at um, this landscape, which um, it's really funny. We, we took so much video at the time and hardly any photographs. And so I was like, this all was green at, you know, in the summertime, but we only, ha only have wintertime pictures. But this is an example of the drainage. So again, this is, this is an area that's right beside the Illinois River. This would, would be a big, huge floodplain. The soil here is really rich, deep, black, beautiful soil. 
but um, but through the, this big um, drainage system, um, the land has drain has been drained. These are old um, what's called tiles. These are like just clay uh, portion um, sections put side by side. That are, you know probably in the 1910s and 20s they would dig up the land and lay these tiles in, and then um, now they they're going back and putting in plastic tiles. So. All across the Midwest, not only is there no more grassland or no more marshland, but there's uh, soy and corn farms with, with a massive drainage system underneath of it. Um, and we came across images like this, which just felt utterly foreign. I'd, I'd never seen anything like this in my life, um, you know, upon moving to, to Illinois. This is, a, is basically a big pile of corn that gets put underneath plastic um, for, um, before it gets sold off. Um, so we tried to think about like how do you read a landscape um, and one that I would say is pretty mundane. We had moved from Los Angeles and before from this beautiful place of Oregon and we ended up in a flat place with corn and soybeans. I was like, what? Um, so, um, so you know, um, you know, like we started this sort of pr practice or I was thinking about a practice of how do you read a landscape, one that, that, that feels like it's mundane, it's not spectacular in any way, um, at least to my register. And, and, and moreover, how do you see histories and struggle in an image like this? So this is a levee along the Illinois River. Before it was levied, poor communities used to uh, fish um, and, and sustain themselves um, off of this river. And when it was levied, that, that could not happen anymore because all those marshes um, and um, sort of swamps got drained off. So, um, and that, you know, there's big struggles. People tried to um, blow up re 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 le levees or tear them down. And so there's all this history in this landscape that we wanted to know about. And of course it's embedded in ideology about the use of land. It's, um, you know, about the people on it and more. So um, in order to sort of start this research practice or start this project, we sort of took up a research practice um, just to sort of echo what Ryan said that meant meeting with scholars, riding on combines, checking out tugboats, <laughs> reading history documents, going into archives um, to understand, um, you know, the landscape is both material and a social place. Um, and how that had changed for the production of commodity crops. And so I didn't even really know what a commodity crop was until moving to central Illinois, um, which means that it's a, you know, a, a crop that's sold, it's usually stored. Um, and um, what else about the commodity crop? Something special, I can't remember what. Anyway, um, but, but we had moved from, um, from Los Angeles to this small town and we had heard a lot about um, international politics on this radio program that I used to listen to called The Ag Report. And um, um, I'd never heard a radio program called The Ag Report that was talking about weather around the world and pork bellies and um, futures. That was another thing they talked about futures a lot. I was like, that's cool, I like the future. But it's really talking about cro um, you know, crops and stocks. Um, so anyway, um, so we did some, we did two, two video projects that look at the landscape around this town of Beardstown. Um, and um, those were short sort of videos that tried to think about like what, how the land is shaped that then gives way to a place like Beardstown. And then the third video, which is much longer, it's like an hour long sort of experimental documentary, looks at the social landscape um, and the human dimensions of of place, um, and we called it Between the Bottomlands because it was the bottomlands of the Illinois River, um, um, this sort of big floodplain of the Illinois River, um, so between the bottomlands and the world. Um, so, um, so this is a slaughterhouse, um, which is only made possible by all that landscape around um, that um, is of soybeans and corn that feeds hogs, um, but also um, there's a whole infrastructure of um, of uh, train rails and barges that connect this rural landscape to the world. Um, and what makes Beardstown interesting, um, um, an interesting story to us or interesting, you know, the community there interesting is because this kind of invisibility of globalism and transnationalism um, and, and the encounters and, um, and struggles of a rural space um, that really just kind of go on, I, I think often go unnoticed. So, um, so what I'm gonna show next is a series of, um, of photographs and, and, and videos that are um, from our research. Um, and then at the end I'll show 
how we sort of made this into um, a, an experimental documentary project. So um, this is uh, Farinock, our friend and researcher, who talks about places like Beardstown um, as, um, as neglected spaces in the research of globalization in the United States. And there has been an assumption that uh, globalization is really a, a matter that affects and it can, it's, it's manifest only in uh, big cities and metropolitan areas. It doesn't see uh, the intensity of transnational relations and uh, globalization uh, forces of global economy and globalization in these non-metropolitan areas and smaller towns like Beerstown. So when you look at Beerstown, you see that how intensely it is a global space. And um, while literature doesn't reflect that, they, they theorize based on experience of New York City, London, you know, Tokyo, Los Angeles. Um, and, and I think it has its limitations when they are not, when they are skipping, you know, that, that literature basically flies over spaces like Beerstown in their theorization and they stop only at these larger metropolitan areas. She was trying to say areas, but we cut her off, sorry. Um, so Beardstown um, is this, like I said, tiny town. It's about 6,000 people. Um, it was you know, located about two and a half hours from where we lived, um, about an hour from the capital of Illinois, Springfield, um, which is also a, a pretty small town by comparison um, to places like Chicago. Um, but, but strangely enough, it was one of the only towns um, that in the region that was dual language and um, outside of the city of Chicago, and most definitely the only trilingual pre-K program. Um, yet it had been, so um, there was French, um, in, uh, English, and Spanish spoken in the pre-K program, and then um, uh, K through eight, it was dual language education. So um, yet it had been a sundown town. So sundown towns, um, the next person, the researcher that we got to interview named James Lowen, um, talks about what a sundown town is, but um, I can't remember the whole entire clip, so I'm gonna tell you. Um, it, these are towns that were, um, that were all over the Midwest, and they were um, basically like um, Jim Crow. They, it, it was the policies of Jim Crow in the North, so I'll let him say. Sundown towns are towns that keep out African Americans uh, that are all white on purpose. Uh, a few of them uh, also, or instead, uh, kept out Jews, or a lot of suburbs did that, uh, kept out Native Americans in the West, kept out Chinese Americans. But the focus, especially in the last 30 years, uh, is towns that kept out, and still keep out in many cases, African Americans. Uh, this move to throw black folks out of towns, or to pass uh, an ordinance, or come to an informal agreement that we're not gonna have them in our town, uh, dates mainly to the era 1890 to 1940. This is the nadir of race relations. That's N-A-D-I-R, low point. Um, it was a time when the U.S. went most racist in its ideology uh, for a whole host of reasons that we don't have time to go in right here. Towns all over the North, it's not a Southern phenomenon, uh, throughout African Americans, in little race riots that are not really recorded, or they pressured them out just by being mean, just by uh, doing things, uh, making it impossible for them to buy food or, or fuel, or harassing them if you're a policeman, um, and so on. Every town on the Illinois River, from the Mississippi all the way up past LaSalle, Peru, including Beardstown and uh, nearby Rushville, which isn't quite on the, on the river, uh, became a sundown town, I think in this era, with the sole exception of Peoria. So that is to say that during the height of the Great Migration, when three million African Americans moved from the southern part of the United States up to cities like Detroit and Chicago, they were had to navigate sort of racist um, landscapes like Beardstown in order to get uh, to places like Chicago, and they didn't stay in these towns. Um, and I, I would say that Jim Lowen is, um, James Lowen is a little um, soft on saying that people weren't, you know, didn't have to just deal with annoying things. They had to deal with death and, and, and brutal violence, right? Um, 
So, um, but he has a great book called Sundown Towns. It's like that big. It's all about sundown towns in, um, in the Midwest. Um, but the thing that's interesting is that this town, Beardstown, was on the river. And river towns are always towns where many people come through. So it just tells you um, how much work it was on the, on the part of white people to keep um, non-white people out. Um, but importantly, Beardstown um, is on the river because it also is a place where um, boats are going in and out and, and all this grain from soybeans and corn are, are bunning, getting put on these boats um, to go down to the Mississippi River. Um, so this is um, the, um, the wall. So here there's not a, um, this is I guess essentially the levee, right, to keep from flooding because this is um, a floodplain. Um, there's this sort of uh, you know, remnants of, of, of uh, past time when uh, the river view was something that you could see. It wasn't behind a concrete wall. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, the role of the river is um, really important because, um, like I said, it's, it's how um, all these grain companies get um, their harvest um, from the fields um, to, to an international market. Um, and still today, um, boat and barge travel is the most sort of efficient way to move large amounts of material. Um, it takes the least amount of energy, supposedly, because you know, it's on the water. It also means that these rivers are really not places that you want to um, hang out and swim in often. Um, so Cargill um, is uh, one of the largest non-publicly traded companies in the world. Um, it's an agribusiness giant. Um, it produces everything from seeds to processed grains to meat to bioplastic to insurance policies to salt um, to bacon. Um, and at the time of our work, um, Cargill um, was the, owned this um, slaughterhouse and it was the main economic engine in the town. Um, um, they employed about 2,000 workers from around the globe. Um, and um, this is a picture from 2010 and like Ryan said, the plant was later bought out by another meat giant, that's a scary term, <laughs> I don't eat a lot of meat, um, called JBS. Um, the plant was originally owned by Oscar Mayer. A lot of people know Oscar Mayer from their hot dogs. Um, and um, we interviewed um, a former line worker um, who worked um, in the Oscar Mayer plant um, um, and worked on through the transition to Cargill um, bef before being pushed out of his job. And, and when the company was owned by, um, it originally opened by Oscar Mayer in 1965, and it was an uh, all-white workforce. Um, that whole time until Cargill took it over. Um, so he described, this worker that we talked to, he described the experience of, of working on the floor um, and the, the, the reorganization of slaughterhouses um, in the you know, eight, late 70s, early 80s, um, resulting in um, more automation and fewer workers. Um, this is some images from the, the local museum in Beardstown. Um, it, uh, Oscar Mayer closed in eight, 1987. Um, Cargo bought it, reopened six months later with non-unionized jobs, um, paying significantly less than before. And the production of slaughtering pigs um, increased from 5,000, slaughtering 5,000 pigs a, get, a day to 18,000. So the work is very difficult. It's low paid work. Um, and it has an 80% turnover rate um, of workers. So, um, so a company like this is constantly recruiting people to move to this small town. And you know, if you know anything about Chicago, Chicago used to be called the butcher to the world. Um, you know, it used to be that all these big slaughterhouses were in Chicago or around Chicago and all the animals were shipped up there, um, held in um, um, stockyards in the city and slaughtered and then um, sent out on train cars. Um, across the country, but but in in this time of reorganization, um, companies moved their slaughterhouses further and further outside of cities because there's less regulation, there's less unions, and then of course there's environmental factors too. So this um, plant actually is one of the major um, uh, polluters of, of the Illinois River um, today. So. Um, um, 
So a whole group of new people started moving into the town because they need a, a huge workforce um, or a large workforce for the town of 6,000 people, 2,000 people were working at the plant. So that's you know a significant workforce for that small of a town. Um, and the turnover is super high. So this next person, Molly, she was a librarian at the time. Um, she discussed this shift and sort of the sort of origin um, and, and, and the beginning of these shifts in, in um, Beardstown. Um, I had a guy call probably a couple months ago and he wanted to come back and research some of his family history and his aunt and uncle lived here in town when he was a kid and the guy's, I think he's in his 60s now, and he said, well, I kind of wanted to stay at the Park Hotel. And I said, well, the Park Hotel's not there anymore. It was torn down in the 90s, you know. And he said, oh, I'm, I'm so sad. We used to stay there every time, you know. And I said, oh, I'm sorry. You know, it, it was pretty dilapidated. <laughs> and it, it, you know, it was, people tried to save it, but it just didn't work out. And, um, and then I realized, you know, he's probably thinking Beardstown's all white, all rural. Um, he probably has no idea what this is like. And so I, I said, I, you know, I want to tell you a few things here about, about Beardstown. And I explained the 57% and the, um, the makeup of, of all the immigrants that we have. And he said, are you serious? And I said, yeah. I said, we have a trilingual staff here at the library. We have to. And he was said, I had no idea. I never would have guessed that that would have happened. And, and then the next question we often get is why? Why? You know, what? what pulls these people in and it's Cargill, you know, that's, that's really the only answer I have for them. So. So she's talking really about that this, you know, this uh, massive need for workers meant recruiting workers from different parts of the world. So initially Cargill started recruiting people from Texas or from other plants that they um, owned across the country and then from Texas um, and, um, and, um, within a few years, um, you know, this big sh demographic shift happens, and she said this 57%, she was talking about their, their high school um, became 57% um, Latinx. So um, this is a big, you know, a big shift for a town that, w again, was historically white by force. So it's kind of major um, social shifts that, that um, people were um, sort of inducted into, if you will. Um, and many scholars understand um, this shift across the Midwest um, as, as specifically about the reorganization of meatpacking. Um, so um, other small towns in Illinois nearby Cargill were like literally losing population. Like we went to other towns nearby and they um, you know, had to shut down their schools or they had to merge schools together because there were so few people there. But in Beardstown, they didn't lose population, but they kept population. Um, they kept stable at 6,000. Um, and, and what changed really was the demographic, right? So there's a sort of new um, you know, um, minority majority, um, which um, was exciting. Um, but, but, but the newcomers to Beardstown um, that first came, um, they didn't always um, um, have a, tr a smooth transition. So this is uh, Claudia, who's, um, who husband, whose husband worked for Cargill, and she describes one of her first experiences in town. But I still remember when I went to the grocery store, and there was, I think it was the first year I came here, I was at the grocery store, and I just knew how to say thank you. <laughs> and and uh, I was paying, and there, and there was this uh, man on, behind me, and he was, I heard him talking, but I didn't know what he was saying. Um, oh, we have a, um, an update from managed software. Okay, I got it, I got it. <laughs> um, um, and so, um, you know, uh, the context of migration in small towns like Beardstown can be really different. So um, the next clip is about 
is from, again, Farinock explaining how sundown histories um, and this sort of violent history was relived when Latinos moved into, into Beerstown in, in the 1990s. Um, so the, the being a sundown town then didn't mean that the blacks or African Americans couldn't work in it or they couldn't come in with the barges, but they had to leave by, by evening. And if, and if they worked in the town, they had to find residence elsewhere. So should that have been the case, like there were domestic workers that had to work in, in Little in, in Beerstown, they would have to live somewhere else. And the place that you could say uh, that the African Americans were shipped for overnight sleeping would be uh, Jacksonville. Jacksonville is a st uh, bigger city and it was segregated already. So it had white neighborhood and it had black neighborhood. So the blacks of, of these sundown towns would go and live in black neighborhoods of, of Jacksonville. Um, the, the more contemporary geography, racial geography, was um, made more complex when Mexicans arrived. So, um, and also when West Africans arrived. So when Mexicans arrived to Beerstown, they were treated, they, you know, they, they kind of, you could say, they were tolerated as honorary whites, if you want to say. So they, they moved into Beerstown. It wasn't easy, and there was important and very um, uh, violent uh, clashes uh, in one incident in 1996, like a few years after the bulk of Mexicans had moved to town, there was actually a six foot tall cross um, burned in, in the plaza and a, a Mexican tavern was burned down. Um, so, and the following day, KKK had a march in town, etc. So you can imagine how, um, and this is, this is 1996, not so long ago, how violent was this encounter. Um, and so that was 1996. In 2005, Immigration Customs Enforcement raised Beardstown, um, which got a lot of national attention and put pressure on Cargill, um, who um, started recruiting from West Africa, Cuba, and Puerto, Ri Puerto Rico. Um, Puerto Ricans have, uh, you know, legal status in the United States, of course, and so um, their um, ability to exploit was a little bit less. Um, West Africans came on diversity visas, and many came from um, um, a small country of Togo, the small country of Togo, um, for employment um, at Cargo. Um, and so in this way, this added the French um, language speakers to the town. Um, and, um, and, it, and, and the first wave people came because they knew people you know, in New York and they heard about jobs or whatever. And then, you know, in, in other waves, people started coming directly from Togo straight to Beardstown um, because they heard about good jobs. Um, so, um, and, and their experience there was different from um, African Americans who really didn't start coming until quite later when Cargill started recruiting from Detroit. And of course, African Americans didn't come because um, because of this long racist history. People knew um, about that history. And so, pe um, as Farinak was saying, some people would live in Jacksonville, which is about 30 minutes away. Um, um, but the Africans um, did settle in Beardstown and the nearby town of Rushville. Um, and so this is the, this is the son of a cargo employee named Joel. He was in his early 20s at the time. And he describes some of the sort of confusion about the racial geography of this town and some of the stereotypes he's heard, um, racist stereotypes that he's heard since being in Beardstown. What I know is, uh, you know, here in this town, we don't, we don't see too much African American here. But uh, uh, I think two years ago, they come in. Yeah, they come in. Uh, because they, they, are, they go to work in Cargill. Yeah. So, and I heard in Rushville, they don't rent, uh, they don't rent uh, apartment to Latino people. I don't know why. If you go to Rushville, you don't see any Latino people here. They don't like them. I don't know why. So first, when they saw the African, they they, they were worried because they, they thought he was the same like uh, <laughs> African American. But African people, I think African people is a kind of guys like uh, they know they move from another part, another country. 
if uh, if African if African American guys and real African people guys go to rent the same apartment, I think the <laughs> the owner will rent the apartment to the African people because they know he pay his rent every month. Mm. He don't have any trouble with African, but African American people, I think they have some trouble to pay their rent. Mm. They are more, they cause more trouble. Yeah. More interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you think that that's true? Do you think that that's what people think? Oh, mm, because uh, I, I discussed sometimes with uh, my friend. He's older than me. He's, uh, he's white. He's white, yeah. He's an older guy. So I used to talk with, with him. So he told me that. So here you can see this like crazy stratification of of different kinds of immigrants who are coming to live and in fact different kinds of you know status of African and African American people that that everyone has to negotiate in this formerly all white town and living there. Um, one thing that's quite interesting is that that, that people do come together and the these um, you know sort of deep and profound ways and so while we were learning this history and learning about how people were navigating being there, what, another thing that we were learning is always in struggle, there is this sort of coming together. And so the soccer field, strangely enough, supported by Cargill, um, outside the plant, you know, they don't pay tax, they didn't pay very many taxes, and so then they would then like, you know, give their money to a, a soccer field or a, you know, whatever, some other public um, um, playground, et cetera. Um, so the, the Cargill sponsored soccer field was actually this site where all these communities did come together um, and through these sort of networks and, and also the, the Catholic Church, um, the Togolese and the Latinos from S Central and South America all went to the Catholic Church. Um, and so it's these different sort of sites where, where people did come together in order to, um, to you know, negotiate this space that had been dominated by white folks. Um, and so what we did with this, um, this work is uh, we interviewed people for uh, several years and we worked with Farinock and interviewed people that she had a harder time getting to talk on camera, like the white people. Um, and um, and we, um, we stitched these stories together to make a, um, a script um, that could then tell this story of a kind of social, this, that, that both the sort of background and history and the current social struggle, which I don't know if all of our clips will get to it, but, but one thing that you should know is that, um, that in fact, the library is trilingual, and in fact, the education programs are trilingual specifically because people organize. So Claudia, who you saw, and Joel, those are dual language teachers, and they organize with white teachers to actually make sure that, 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 the, um, that dual language programs were, were there precisely because the teachers knew that the language was one gap that, um, that could kind of stitch people together. So in every place that, they, that something looks mundane now, I always am reminded that actually there's always this, you know, um, uh, communities negotiating each other and, and that, that actually is something um, sort of rich and hopefully that um, the kind of racism that has been embedded in Beerstown for so long can be, um, you know, um, over, I don't wanna say overcome, um, can, 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 that life can be different because the people who are living there now are, are shaping that place now. So, um, so we took all that research and, um, and not using any of our own stories or any of our own interventions and stitched together this story um, of Beardstown in this documentary and, um, and, or experimental documentary. And then we hired actors to read the parts and, and some actors are reading multiple parts, and they might change their clothes, but um, but they you know they don't take up another voice or anything like that. Um, and so they're actually just kind of reading scripts in sites around town. Um, and there's a lot of reasons why we chose that kind of format, which I can speak to later. But um, but here's a, like a five minute, this, and this is in. This is a five minute clip of how we used all this different research to 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 tell a story. here researching family history. 
or their grandparents lived here and they visited here. I I had this guy call uh, a couple of months ago and he wanted to come back and do some research on the family history. And uh, this guy, he said, I think he's in his 60s now. He said, well, I, I kind of wanted to stay at the Park Hotel. And I said, well, the Park Hotel's not there anymore. They tore it down in the 90s. And, and I realized that this guy, he probably thought that Beardstown was all white, all rural. He probably had no idea what it's like. So I said to him, well, um, I'd like to tell you a few things about Beardstown. So I explained to him about the makeup of the immigrant population here. And he said, are you serious? And I said, well, yeah, um, the library staff is trilingual. It has to be. And he says, I had no idea. I would never have imagined that that could have happened. And the next question that we always get is, well, why? What, you know, what pulls these people here? I first heard about Beardstown from some Togolese friends who already live over here. We talk to each other on the phone, we write letters back and forth, and they told me that Beardstown is a very small town, but has everything you need. Uh, schools, work, and a lot of immigrant people live here, uh, like Spanish, African people, so it is no problem to live in Beardstown. So I decided to come here because they told me there is a company that will hire for you to work. So I came, and I got the job. The capacity to organize this community is a principal difficulty. We're doing it slowly, but we, we don't have time. Uh, and yeah, there are, there are a lot of um, Anglos working under the same situations, but, um, but they are part of the Anglo community. They, they have owners of businesses, they have uh, directors of institutions, and how can we do this for the workers? You know, for, for those who don't have time to rest, that they don't have time to get food, uh, to clean their houses, uh, do their laundry. We have to recognize the newcomers and immigrants are here because the production system is demanding labor. And we're doing it, but slowly. And we don't have time. The first day I went to Cargill and, and I was given a tour, I just prayed to God and I said, God, please help me. Uh, give me the power to endure this because I still have to help my family in Mexico. Me, I'm a very active person. I used to, I used to it a little bit, but, but it's very hard. Imagine you have a huge piece of meat. You receive like a, a thousand pieces coming, coming, like a whole leg, a big leg at that. A thousand in eight hours. You gotta turn and, and cut it like that. And it will hurt. Uh, I snip the tendons. My fingers are hot. Sometimes when I wake up, I can't close my hands. Uh, if I tell them I have a problem, they fire me. So yeah, my first year here was hard. <laughs> I told my wife I would want to go back because I can't live in this situation because the job was so hard every day. My fingers were sore, my hands were worn out. I, 
the line the line speed was too fast. I remember that sometimes I would come home, I would get sick, I'd stay sick all the time. I would have a fever, my hands would hurt, my legs would hurt, my back would hurt. It was physically demanding. I would sometimes cry because I'd never worked this hard in my whole life. Back in the line, everybody was doing what they had to do, so I must do it too. A bunch of different clips that are not all lined up perfectly. I mean, they're not um, sequential necessarily. There um, that that um, described really some of the labor, um, obviously, of the meat packing plant. Um, other parts of the video talk about uh, um, the history and the sort of sundown history, um, and and again about that kind of social struggle. And so you saw that you know people there who we interviewed were both had comfort to work at Cargill but also ended up being you know community organizers and activists because they saw a need to have a um, you know an African union um, in the church that could support other folks coming from Africa to work there or um, a community rights organization came in because of, um, of when the KKK marched um, and people were um, organized together to to um, you know make sure that they could actually sustain and live together so um, you know, when, when um, you know, we moved to the Midwest, one thing we had heard, we were living in a small town in Champaign-Urbana, which is about 150,000 people. We had heard that small towns across the Midwest were dying, that they were losing people, that, you know, resources and jobs had all gone overseas. And so we thought, how is it that, um, that in this town people are coming here? And it's precisely because of the landscape, because, um, you know, there's hogs to be slaughtered there, and there's corn to be grown, and soybeans to be to be harvested. So, um, you know, we're interested in how um, this community um, was um, both characterized by popular authors as, um, you know, um, uh, immigration was going to save the American Midwest, um, but also how, you know, there there's real struggle and um, and uh, social identities being remade. Um, so that people could live there and that that was um, both kind of an exciting thing to see how um, communities organized and struggled for social justice and for their own lives, um, but also, um, you know, a challenge, right? Um, a challenge uh, for a community that had been all white for so long. So, um, so um, today in Beardstown and in Rushville, there's a Mexican Independence Day, there's an Africa Day, um, and you know we don't suggest that um, that a place like um, Cargill um, is the way to make an integrated Midwest. <laughs> um, um, but um, you know under the capitalist logics, um, you know the Midwest actually needs immigration, um, and that um, and that in under capitalist logic. Um, this kind of reverse of people come here to um, send money home, but um, but it actually is the sort of sole thing that is making these communities stay alive. So, um, yeah, that's it. Thanks.